Good morning, one and all. Welcome to Garden America. We are back in the saddle. Happy Labor Day weekend. You know, they say that Labor Day weekend usually represents the end of summer. Uh, the wise guys love this time of year, college football, NFL. But one thing Labor Day does not represent is a cooling trend. It is hot. <laughs> Labor Day or no Labor Day, uh, here in San Diego, Southern California, many areas, we are scorching. A lot of you listening right now and uh, watching us live on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live can attest to that. Let's go to John first, Tiger, because John lives in an area of San Diego where 100 degrees is actually cool this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about cool, but it's certainly the norm this time of year. Did you happen to read the newsletter this week, Brian? I did. I perused it, but I didn't do a deep dive. I wrote an article called uh, Six Hot Tips to Cool Things Down. That I did look at because I was hot. <laughs> <laughs> You're still hot. Thank you. The um, There's so many things you can do, and I was thinking of you on the way to work this morning because uh, – you have a smaller yard than I do. Oh, I have much. I got a, a patio and, and some property in the front. And one of the things I did not put in uh, as a tip to when it's hot outdoors to control your plants was a misting system. You can go to Home Depot, any of the home improvement centers, get one of those misting systems. And that's a great way for plants on a patio or in containers to cool things off. You know, they use it when you go to a resort or someplace, Palm Springs by the pool, they've got misters to cool Or if you off. live in Arizona or Texas, any store you walk into, it's got those, right? I think some cars in Arizona have misters inside the car. I was just looking at uh, round-trip tickets to Phoenix from San Diego, $34. But yeah, nobody's going. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Not this time of year. more expensive to take a bus. Yeah. But there's certain basic things you need to do. For instance, water first thing in the morning. Or in Tiger's case, if you're getting up early to go to work, water yeah. last thing at night. Or as yeah. I did yesterday because I was home right in the middle of the day. So do you guys want to cool you off? You can. You know, that that reminds me of a misnomer. I, ever since— I know what you're going to say about I burning can plants. Yeah, people would say, don't water in the heat of the day because you're going to get water on the leaves and you're going to burn the leaves. That's— to my knowledge, that's not true at all. I've never experienced that. I yeah. watered yesterday, like I said, in the middle of the day. My plants loved me. Thank you. It was getting so hot <laughs> out here. I needed to be cooled off. Wouldn't you like to be cooled off and sprayed at, at uh, noon? Absolutely, yeah. Well, and then, and then you know, we just talked about it, you know, at night versus the morning. And it is true. A lot of research is saying you should water in the early morning. Right. So that way it's there's no wind. It, it absorbs into the they, ground. They can establish the water for the day. Exactly. Before before the sun comes out to evaporate it off. And that that is true if you live in an area that has a lot of humid disease issues. You know, we talk right. about roses. You don't want to get water on the foliage, mildew, rust, black spot. Sure. You know, any of that stuff. But in a dry environment like us in Southern, Southern California or Arizona, Utah, Texas, you know, some parts of Texas, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not harmful to water at night because – it's dry, <laughs> and and, right, uh, right. and we don't have the same disease problem issues as some of those very humid environments. But, you know, even in a humid environment, the best time to water is at night. Also, really. And the reason is, take your lawn, for example. Yeah. Uh, if you water your lawn at night, the uh, humidity between the top of the blade of grass and the, the ground is 100%, right? Right. If you don't water and there's dew on the grass, the humidity is 100%. Still, still you can't 100%. get more than 100%. Yeah. So studies have actually shown that if you water during the night, the grass is going to be exposed to less 100% humidities than if you water during the day because you've got humidity all night mm -hmm. at 100%. Then you're going to, if you water in the morning, you're actually extending, extending that it. period. Right, 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 oh. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And humidity is what we're talking about when it comes the pr the problem with that is disease, right? I mean, right. that's the biggest thing. Well, the, the disease organisms thrive, thrive in humid, in condi humid wet, conditions, right? You know, environments. And so, you know, there's there's really no other problem. So if you don't have a disease prone plant or area of the right. landscape, then you you can water at night because then, you know, at night, I mean, I don't know if there's been research done on this, but do plants sleep? Right? Are they not absorbing water at night? Are they not working? Are they not, <laughs> you know, doing any of that stuff? You know, that's not all that crazy of a question. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe they're doing it less because there's no photosynthesis and 
trans you know abrasion you know now you right? might get into the whole biological cell structure what what are those cell structures doing at night are are they not doing anything is it like brain waves yeah i don't know I'm sure well so. they're not they're um during the day they use oxygen give off carbon dioxide right right, right. at night they do the opposite they absorb right. carbon dioxide yeah and give off oxygen yeah well, so there is something different at night yeah are they they absorb <clears throat> oxygen? You're saying they do the opposite? Yeah, yeah, at night. So they absorb oxygen? Yes. Okay. And give no, off no, carbon no. dioxide. No, no, no. That's what they, they do the opposite of that. Carbon they, dioxide at night. Right. And then give off oxygen. Right. Oh, okay. I I, I've it. never heard of You're giving me a headache now. Yeah. I've never heard because that. Because that's but, what they do during the day. So this all gets back to Tiger thinking, what kind of changes happen at night? Yeah. Do yeah. the plants sleep? Now, during know? the day, they absorb... Carbon dioxide, dioxide and, and give, give off, off oxygen. oxygen. So at night, they absorb oxygen and, and give, give off carbon dioxide. Right. In other words, they become, at night, what we do all the time. Yeah. They become human. You're, by the way, your cake is ready. <laughs> they become human. That was a plants. message from Mike Pompeo. I'm going to have to return it later. <laughs> <laughs> that little ding you heard. So we are back. Oh. It is Labor Day weekend. Many of yeah. us have a long three-day weekend off. And as I mentioned, uh, college football in full swing. Tiger, you're going to the Aztec game today. Yeah, brand new stadium. Brand new excited. stadium. Uh, NFL right around the corner. So people start thinking about, ooh, the fall weather, going to get a bit chilly. This, I don't see that in our forecast for a while This here. is always the time of year when we're watching. <clears throat> sorry. But sports are on the TV all the time. And we're seeing the games played. And we're seeing people getting to get bundled up in sweaters and attend these, you know, football games, baseball games. And and then here in San Diego, we have another three months of shorts and T-shirt weather. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, you know what? It's great when people like to interact with us and respond to our conversations. John is reading up on those right now. All right. Tiger. A couple of responses there. Um, I, I, like I say, I, just with what I have, I've watered during the day before. I've never had a plant burn. Yeah. Maybe it's because of the type of plants I have. Could be, too, right? Because that's the thing. I mean... You know, John brings up this point a lot of times that, you know, in nature, they don't get control of when they're watered or how they're watered or, or any of that stuff. Yes, we do water certain ways to prevent things like we talked about disease and, you know, all these other things. But at the same time, I mean, you know, you talk we talk about humid environments in Florida. They don't get to stop the rain because plants are getting mildew on them. Right. It, just, it rains. It rains. And it's. Always like that, and they just go with it. I just got a shipment of roses from Mississippi. Uh huh. And it's been raining like crazy over there, right? So they called before they sent it and said, Hey, we just want to let you know the plants are on the way. They won't have a lot of leaves on them <laughs> because of all the rain. Sure. And, and actually, the, the plants looked great, but uh -huh. no leaves. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things you're talking about, Tiger, too, is um, plants out in nature where they can't control the environment. The problem with landscapes is a lot of the plants in our landscapes would not be found in, in that environment. Yeah. You know, because they're imported from different areas of the of the world. So in San Diego, our, we have a Mediterranean climate. If you bring in plants from the Mediterranean, they're going to fare much better than other plants. You know, our guest last week, John Clements, was talking about uh, some plants, if you water in the heat of the day, that they're instantly dead. <laughs> and he's mentioning uh, especially natives, right, California we, we, natives. We've talked about this before, how many we've killed. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. and we talked about the ceanothus that mm -hmm. all died at my house, except one plant just thrived. And this spring was probably 10 times the size wow. of when it got planted, full bloom. I went out there yesterday. It's completely dead. No! <laughs> as black as can be. Hey, no. let's um, let's squeeze in John's quote of the week here. We've got uh, just a little bit of time before the uh, first uh, break and uh, segment number two. We'll bring in our guest. Our guest today, by the way, for those that do not receive the newsletter, Tiger. Yeah, we're going to be talking with uh, my good friend Nick Davis. He's a uh, farmer in the Central Valley near or in Madera, California. And we're going to be talking about the uh, grape harvest, but also he's an almond farmer and you grape, know, has almonds. A, a lot of insight on another, a lot of farming. Okay. Hot topic right here in California. And questions, comments are welcome. 
That's uh, coming up next next segment, John. But now we have... Yeah, and I picked this quote because of um, what we're going through, trying to keep plants alive and watering, and Tiger's going to be talking to a farmer. And this quote comes from uh, someone you wouldn't think of when you're talking about gardening, Herman Cain. And Mr. Cain said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you love what you're doing, you'll be successful. That's absolutely correct. When and you want to get a job, you want you want a job that that you get you're to go to about right. Yeah, that you get to go to, not have to go to. Yeah, I I have to go to work. I yeah. get to go to work. Two different things. And that's the way I feel about gardening. It's not a chore. No. It's something I just can't wait to do. <laughs> okay, it is break time. We're going to take a break for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. Thank you for tuning in. This is last week's pre-recorded show. For the rest of you, and of course, Biz Talk Radio, going to take a break, bring on our guest. This is Garden America. Happy Labor Day weekend. I'm Brian Maine, John Begnasker, Tiger Palafox, back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. Okay, we are back. It is uh, Garden America, obviously, here on your Saturday, Long Labor Day weekend. I'm Brian Maine. John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox. We are ready to go. We've got uh, all the uh, pre-show business out of the way, as uh, they say. Whoever they is, Tiger, I don't know, but I know who you are, and you're going to bring on our guest today, uh, Nick, and talking about a lot of various uh, activities and things that he's involved with. Yeah, so this morning we have Nick Davis joining us um, from the Central Valley, uh, where Nick is a farmer and he has a um, orchard of almonds. And uh, Nick, what would you call a grape uh, farm? Is that an orchard also? Well, you'd call a, a grape farm probably a vineyard. Right? Vineyard. A vineyard. Oh, there you go. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And trees would be orchards. There you go. So, Nick, thank you very much for joining us this morning. How's your morning going? So far, so good. Another harvest morning in Central Valley. Yeah, and it's it's warm up there right now, and you guys are in the middle of the grape harvest, correct? Right. Um, what, tell us a little bit about what uh, what kind of grapes you grow up there. Sure. Well, we grow um, several varieties of wine grapes, all wine grapes. Uh, they are Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, um, Ruby Red, which some don't uh, know too much, but it's a it's a red juice grape that they use to color up wines. We farm um, Merlot, Zinfandel, and a few others. And now this is a family farm up there in, um, you know, all through Madeira and near Fresno. Um, and there's a lot of other great uh, vineyards near you as well, right? That's a big area for growing grapes. Yeah, in fact, wine grapes in my county is Madeira County. Uh, wine grapes have been in the top 10 uh, commodities farmed in our county for like the last 60, 70 years. Wow. So wine grapes in our area have been very popular. 
um, and have been around for a very long time, whereas something like almonds haven't really been in the top ten. Um, they are now, of course, but they haven't been for a long time. So wine grapes are really established in our neck of the woods. Oh, so almonds are kind of a new crop for your region then. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would, relatively new compared to how long farming has been established in our neck of the woods, yeah. right? So uh, almonds really, uh, you know, the almonds have been around since the 80s and early the late 70s, but uh, they haven't really taken off until the last probably 20 years or maybe 20, yeah, 20 years or so. And they really blew up in the early 2000s. And, um, and so now there's quite a few acres of almonds. Almonds are unique because they only grow in a few areas in the, in the world, uh, one being here in, here in uh, Central California, but also um, in Australia. So the, not, not many places to grow almonds. Oh, yeah. And, and almonds are becoming a, a very popular product because aside from just the table almond, Aren't they using almonds in a lot more items? I mean, you know, we hear all about almond milk. We hear uh, what's that, um, that, you know, different like hummus dip kind of things that use almonds as a base. Um, you know, they're just, they're just using a lot of almonds for more than just eating the nut, right? Right. So that's what's special about almonds, unlike other nuts, like not to put down pistachios, but pistachio <laughs> is basically a, st- a snacky nut, right? Yeah. You don't really find a pistachio powder. At least not yet, or pistachio milk. But almonds are unique in the sense where they 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 make several products out of them. Primarily, almonds are the big market is for snacking, of course. But besides snacking, they uh, they shave them. They're uh, they're diced, sliced, blanched almond milk, almond powder, almond protein, and uh, it's they it's that way because um, it's a very unique and nutritious nut. It's, it's special in that regard. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of kind of interesting because, I mean. The products you're using, uh, or the products that you're creating, I mean, you know, are some of them are end user products, meaning like you know that that almond nut that you pick from the tree could end up going into you know a a bag of almonds, and someone's going to eat that. Grapes, it sounds like more you're you're more crushing, not too many table grapes, you know. Um, so, does that different in the sense of farming because, you know. Are there almonds that are like less quality that they wouldn't use for snacking, but they can use them for creating a powder? Yeah, in fact, you know, people will think of you know an almond is an almond, right? It's shaped, it's uniquely shaped, and can recognize what an almond looks like. But there's actually quite a few varieties of almonds, and there's early there's varieties that are harvested early in the season. There's there's varieties that are harvested later in the season. Some of them have a really hard shell. Uh, which is uh, important for like pest management. Mm. There are some that have a really soft shell, which is you know important for pest management. So we would get um, you know bugs. You know bugs love fresh nuts and, and, and fruit, right? Mm-hmm. So we have to protect them. But of course, uh, they'll, they'll get worms inside the shell very easily. In particular, navel orange worm. I don't know if some of your listeners have dealt with that, but um, that's a real common pest in, in almonds. So there's there's different characteristics of almonds. Like on the farming side, we they are farmed a little bit differently. They have different uh, pest management programs, different watering programs, uh, nutritional demands. Um, as far as the end user goes, you know, like what the end use of the nut. Um, usually, a, like a California variety, which would be your later varieties and have a hard shell, typically known as like Butte and Padre varieties. Those will actually be uh, used in a different application. Than a non pareil variety. A non pareil variety is is the most popular variety in almonds, uh, with the more majority of the acreage planted in non pareil. It's one of the first varieties to come off, and it's your largest nut. So it's a you know as far as looks and appearance and, and flavor goes, a lot a lot of people go for that the non pareil variety. And also brings the most price, but it's also the most challenging to farm. Oh yeah, so so it's finding that balance of you know challenge to farm. You know, you know, you got pests, you got watering, you got how they grow, and so you kind of uh, have to, you know, find that balance on the different varieties. You can't just plant one, just like you were saying with the grapes. You know, you have multiple varieties of grapes, right? Because if you just grow one, you know, you're gonna have a problem maybe during harvest if you have a bug problem, disease issue, or maybe the weather wasn't perfect. You were mentioning when I was talking to you earlier this week about it's getting hot, and you're real worried about those. Grapes turn into raisin, right? They're on the vine, huh? Right. So, you know, just like almonds, wine grapes are very similar. We have different varieties, and the different varieties uh, bring with them different growing characteristics 
and, and needing different management practices. And some varieties uh, on the lower vigor side, such as Pinot Grigio uh, that we farm, also also Chardonnay, they're typically a, a, a weaker or let's, let's say not as vigorous of a vine, which makes it um, a less vigorous canopy. And the canopy really serves as a protective protection layer uh, for the fruit, right? Yeah. They're protected against the elements and direct sunlight. Well, if if if, uh, if we have vineyards that have a light canopy and maybe they're in a, they're planted in a lighter soil, like a sandier <laughs> soil, they don't have as much available nutrients, as available water, and therefore will 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 provide a lighter canopy. And in in the weather we're having, is it's dangerous. You know, every farmer think every farmer right now knows what the weather is going to be over the next seven days. <laughs> yeah. And every one of us are thinking about, we've got to keep the water on the vines. We've got to do the best we can because this sunlight and this intense sun and heat is going to shrivel up the berries. And that doesn't help anybody. That that it ruins, it, it reduces the fruit quality. So the winery isn't super excited about getting raisins. <laughs> um, and then the farmer soup is not as excited because it reduces the tonnage per acre, which we work so hard to get every year. Which is yeah. Hey, Nick, we're going to have to take a break. Sorry to cut you off. When we get back, we'll continue chatting with Nick Davis about uh, farming in the Central Valley. Yeah, do stay with us, and especially those on uh, Facebook Live. Questions, comments for Nick or one of us talking about grapes, almonds, harvesting. I do see a couple on our Facebook feed right now. Again, as uh, Tiger mentioned, going to take a break for our friends on BizTalk Radio. Welcome to your Labor Day weekend, Brian Maine, Garden America, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, back after these messages from our good friends on BizTalk Radio. Hey, just like that, we are back from the break. Thank you to our great sponsors on BizTalk Radio, Stephanie and her team keeping us on the air. We are back live. It is Facebook Live, your Labor Day weekend. We're talking about nuts this morning, <laughs> not not the ones here in the studio, Tiger. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. he talked about the biggest yep. nut earlier. I'm not sure if that was directed toward us, but Tiger, let's get back to you, Nick. You know what I just realized? We're talking about grape nuts. Right, because we're talking grapes oh, the cereal? and nuts. The, the cereal, yeah. So you know, Nick, Nick, that should be the the name of your farm right there, Grape Nuts, because you know it's like the cereal. <laughs> yeah. But um, hey, Nick, sorry to cut you off earlier. You were just describing to um our listeners about what can affect the harvest. We talked about weather. We talked about watering. Um, you know, the different varieties of of grapes, the different varieties of almonds, and how this all affects you because what happens is when you harvest this you take this to a, a processing place and and they pay based on the weight and quality of whatever material you're delivering and you know you were saying you know the next week for farmers in the central valley it's a critical time because it's going to be very hot and it's in the middle of the harvest now i you know, brought you on the program this morning because I love your Instagram and the videos you've shown because you show a a real great insight into farming in, in the real life of farming. You know, the the troubles that you deal with when it comes to irrigation, pest, uh, trucking, uh, labor. Um, but right now in California, water is a big deal. And you've done a few videos on showing people how you guys irrigate problems with the irrigation and different things. Um, so give us a little bit of insight for the California farmers right now on some of the problems that they're having with irrigation, because I mean, it's a critical time. You're harvesting the product. You can't just cut off the water, right? Right. Well, we are in a very, um, monumental time, I think in agriculture in California and in particular in the central Valley where we are uh, located, we're sort of the epicenter and the beginning of what's to come as far as water regulation. Now, for a long time, farmers, when they buy a piece of property, uh, it's just typical when you buy land, it comes with all the mineral rights above and below it. Well, and years ago, it's been decided that uh, farmers no longer own the water below the ground at which they purchase. So that's been a hard pill to fa farmers to swallow. 
Um, so there's there's a transition of thinking from the old old school farmers to new school farmers, and um, the the water is is regulated now. There's a there's, a, there's legislation passed uh, called Sigma, a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014, and it requires all the groundwater basins to be in balance by 2040. In the state of California, and the the, the uh, state water board is 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 allowing farmers to to come up with solutions. Uh, themselves instead of them coming in and take and, and making decisions for us. And so we feel good about that, but it's a real challenge to understand how the hydrology and the dynamics work um, um, uh, under underground. But we are working together with our affiliate organizations like Farm Bureau and local water districts to come up with our groundwater management plan, uh, which have already been uh, submitted to the state water board. And so now we are in the process of implementing those plans um, together and uh, ensuring that we are not overdrafting our, our, our sub basin, our groundwater, uh, as we have in the past. So even though we have been responsible water users for a long time, uh, we're learning that, that there's still more opportunity for us to eat even better. And to, to achieve that is going to be extremely challenging for farmers to, to do, but we're all on board trying to figure it out. And it's a real, it's a real struggle, but we'll, we're, we're doing the best we can uh, with the resources that we have. Yeah. And I mean, I want to point out to the listeners, too, that, you know, I don't think I don't think anybody out there like um, doesn't think that farmers are, are doing what they can. But I mean, you know, people have to understand that water is is money for a farmer. And if you're using a lot of water, that's more money in your crop, which, you know, depletes your profits and, you know, everything else. So, you know, you're trying to be as sustainable with the watering as you possibly can, because it's economically better for a farmer um you know and at the end of the day you know this is where i mean you just said you know almonds is an example one of the very few areas of the world that almonds grow um if if we can't grow almonds in the central valley then you know where will they come from and now we're dealing with a whole nother problem where where are we going to get our food from so i i hope that in the next uh 10 15 years you farmers can um you know make some great headway and hopefully the uh, state will give you guys some good leeway on being able to use, use the water. Because I think uh, Nick, you're, you're pretty involved with the farm bureau. Uh, I mean, California is a huge producing state across the board for agriculture, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if the food's not coming, you know, from California, I mean, where else are we going to be able to get it from? Well, I think California produces 80% of the world's almonds, or, or if not more. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you know? Yeah, you know, so the water conversation is, uh, is touchy, right? But, you know, I always tell people, I always tell people, um, uh, you know, if, if you want to learn a little bit about what, what, uh, what, what farmers deal with, you know, then I want you to plant a garden. <laughs> and yeah. I know a lot of your listeners are are gardeners, I think, and that's awesome that they are. I love gardening myself. Even though we farm, I still have a garden, and I really enjoy it. But I'm not a tomato farmer. I'm not a potato farmer. I'm not an eggplant farmer. But I, I grow those in my garden, and I don't know when to harvest them. I don't know when to plant them. I don't know how much water they should take. I don't know, uh, you know, everything else, what pests are going to be, what, what they're susceptible to, what diseases. So I'm learning along the way. But... Just like in agriculture, uh, you know, other, you know, if you want to learn how what farmers go through, plant a garden. But I know your 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 listeners always do that. But the water topic in almond that surrounds almonds is is challenging because, yes, you know, it does. People do say that it takes a gallon of water per nut, and I totally understand that, right? But if we have to dissect every single crop in California to find out how much water, how much water they uh, it uses, I mean, uh, beef takes a lot, right? If you're a meat eater. If you're a plant eater, it's the same. But I mean, it's long story short, it just takes water to grow, to grow crops. Yeah. Well, you know, it he, sounds like he has all the qualifications to host our show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to yeah, say, it, say anyway. it anyway. Here we go. Some people might say that uh, a, a waste of water or a bad use of water would be to take half of your supply and dump it in the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I was talking to a gentleman. Uh, at a winery, we were wine tasting. My wife and I was talking to a gentleman about farming, and he, he's a he's a wine, he's a small boutique winery. He farms vineyards in the Central Coast, and he started talking negatively about almond farming and and uh, about water usage. And you know, I just like to listen and you know, hear their side of the story, obviously. 
And I was, he says, you know, why can't you plant another crop that uses less water? And I, and I said, well, my family o- over the last decades, you know, I'm fourth generation family farmer. We've grown everything from pumpkins to savage corn to alfalfa hay, uh, you name it. You know, my, my grandparents were in dairy for 46 years. And so he says, just plant something else. And I say, yeah, but my family doesn't have the knowledge to, 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 to grow tomatoes or to grow cotton or to grow jojoba or call it whatever you want. We don't have the equipment. We don't have the tractors. It, it t- it's taken decades and a lifetime to acquire the assets and the tools necessary to farm what we farm. So mm-hmm. a farmer just can't switch over to a new crop like, like just do that. Like, <laughs> no, it's taken a long time to figure this game out. You know, we can't just do that. So it's a you know, I, I, challenging conversation, but I wish we could. But yeah. that's kind of where we are. I, you, you could always pull up some of your trees and put in Nopalis. <laughs> just uh, yeah. just have a yeah yeah a tune then, what yeah, a tune sure they use less water i don't know if you can make no polis milk or, yeah. <laughs> or no polis butter but oh right but um you know um kind of to go back to the the grapes there nick um you know again i think one of the uh things that i i love about following you on instagram is you showing how things are harvested and then you know, it goes now through into production and, you know, it's just wonderful insight. Like you mentioned, if people want to get some knowledge on, on farming, you know, plant a garden. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't think people quite always see how intensive it is. Like when you talk about like the tractors, the fields, the, 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 the pest management, um, and, it's 12 months out of the year. Hey, Nick, we're going to have to take a break here in about a minute. When we get back um, from the break, I just want to wrap up chatting with you about, you know, the grapes and how 12 months, you know, you know, they are dormant for a period of time, but you're always busy right. doing things. So when we get back from break, sure. we'll keep chatting with Nick Davis. Yeah, we do have a few questions. Yeah, so let's perfect. get to those questions as well, uh, which obviously are, are on topic and exactly what we're discussing this morning. So, again, as the Tiger mentioned, it is break time. Got to stay uh, in time, in step with our good friends on the network, Biz Talk Radio. By the way, this is a pre recorded show from last week. If you want to watch us, listen to us live, you can go to our Facebook page every week, six minutes after the hour, eight o'clock on the Pacific Coast, Eastern Time Zones, 1106. Catch us live. Uh, go to our Facebook page. That's Garden America Radio Show. Back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. We are back, and if you are listening to us on BizTalk Radio, this is the uh, final segment of our number one. News coming up top of the hour. We're back at six minutes after two hours. Hopefully your market does carry us both hours. Tiger, we are right back with uh, Nick and uh, wrapping things up for this uh, Labor Day weekend with Nick. So let's continue our conversation. And, again, John does have some questions from our Facebook uh, uh, viewers, I should say. Yeah, why don't we go with the questions first here? All right, uh, Nick, Linda in Reading wants to know if she – Puts in a grape plant, how long before she can harvest grapes? Uh, typically 18 months. So if you plant in, in, a win, in the winter, let's say um, a dormant vine in right. January, February, uh-huh. uh, you'll, you'll have grapes uh, depending on your you know, the soil type and how well you can take care of it the following fall. Mm. So wow. Not that year, but the following year uh-huh. in uh, September or so. Okay. Great. Good to know. And then these questions might be a little more challenging because they're from Hastam, <laughs> Hastam in Pakistan. <laughs> uh-huh. And um, he said that he has two questions. Uh, first of all, he said that uh, in pa- Pakistan, they graft almonds onto peach uh, rootstocks. And he wants to know the difference between an almond that would be grown on a peach rootstock and one that was grown from seed. Right. Great question. And that's true. All almonds are grown on peach rootstocks. Oh. The peach rootstock is uh, more favorable to the growing conditions. The rooting structure uh, is more favorable for um, anchoring the tree to the, to the ground, um, absorbing nutrients, and very compatible with grafting to the almond plant. So for whatever reason, that's why peach trees are favorable and um, resistant to nematodes and disease and everything else. So it's a very compatible rootstock to almond trees. Yeah. Have you had any in knowledge of growing an almond from seed? 
I mean, is that just something that they just don't do just because it takes so much time? I mean, if if you have um, sometimes almonds will be left in the field after harvest, they get they get uh, sunken down in little pockets of uh, of the orchard floor, and they'll get cut, dirt cover up, cover them up over the year, and they'll grow. You'll grow almond trees, but it won't. It, it'll be an almond plant. It looks just like an almond tree, but it won't have the the correct uh, rootstock. Oh. So if you actually open a peach pit, if you have a peach and open the peach pit, you'll see a seed that looks nearly exactly like an almond on the net. Yeah. And then Hastam's uh, other question was, uh, can they grow, and I don't know if, you, if you'd know this, but uh, can you grow temperate area almond varieties in subtropical climates? Well, I don't I, I think he should try. I mean, I don't, I don't know <laughs> yeah. the, the answer to that, but they. So the problem with that is well, almonds do need a certain degree of of a chill of chilling hours. Mm. So the the winters in California are are nice because they're mild winters, but they're just enough to reach that that threshold that they need to be productive and and break dormancy in the in February. The yeah, year. yeah, and we've talked about that before, where you know a lot of the stone fruits require certain hours of chill. You know, we talk about how in San Diego we can't grow cherries, or at least right. a lot of varieties of cherry, because we just don't get cold enough. And almond is a pretty low chill nut, right? Well, Nick? there and there's different varieties, so maybe in uh, if you're in a subtropical climate, try to pick varieties that have the lowest, lowest. chill. Yeah, um, yeah, because I mean, yeah, that's the the tough thing is that people don't realize that you know these. Trees, in order to produce fruit, actually have to rest for a period of time. Um, any other questions, John? I I think I got got them all. I'm, I'll Perfect. double check while you're all right finishing up there. Well, Nick, um, you know, uh, lots of I know you're very busy right now in the middle of harvest. Um, you know, I know that you know I um, you know drew you from uh, in the middle of working. Farmers yeah. work seven days a week. I'm sure. Um, you know, thank you very much for joining us. Lots of great information. Um, before the last break, I did mention that, you know, you're, you're in the middle of your grape harvest time. Um, how much longer are you going to be harvesting grapes? And then what do you do right after you're done harvesting grapes? You take a long vacation. (laughs) My wife would love that. Yeah. I (laughs) doubt it. We don't, there's, I mean, you take a vacation, but there's always work to be done. So we get back to the farm. Harvest will continue in our in the Central Valley probably through the end of October. It's usually about a two and a half to three month season. Early varieties start late July, early August, and then we go through late October, middle to late October, later varieties. Right after that, we want to put on uh, uh, a po- one post harvest irrigation, one last irrigation, and then a little bit of fertilizer um, to help um, it go to sleep and wake up with strong. A, you know, a strong wake up strong in the dormant time, and then we go right into dormant uh, pruning, which is something we wait until the first frost, which is usually we try to use it around Thanksgiving or so, uh, but at least uh, early December we can get going on pruning, and it just keeps going the cycle. There's different seasons, different activities that we, that we do, and we just do it all over again. Wow. Well, Nick, good luck. I hope you have a great harvest, and uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your weekend and. Uh, have a good rest of Labor Day weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Take care. You All as right. well. All right. Take care, Nick. Good information. Thank you much. And uh, as John mentioned, we did cover most of those questions. Yeah, man, that's tough. And, you know, I mean, you know, Nick you touched on it where it's pretty awesome, where if you want to get some good insight in what a farmer does grow a garden, you know, no matter what it is, you see how difficult things can be. But, um, I mean, imagine doing that on 200 acres, 1,000 acres. And, yeah. you know, you can have one small problem that could wipe out hundreds and hundreds of acres for that. And if you're counting on that, that's one, 10, 30 percent of your 50 percent of your income for the year. It makes yeah. John's yeah. three and a half hour watering schedule seem like nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, we have a question from Jan in Brentwood up in the Bay Area. And she says that there's vineyards on all the foothills around her. And she wants to know if grapes and roses get the same diseases because they plant roses at the foot of uh, the grape rose um, because yeah. they get diseases first. Yeah, they, they, it's don't mi- they call those canary plants or something like that? No? 
<laughs> well, if, with um, roses, they're called indicator roses. Indicator. Yeah. Indicator plants. Yeah. yeah they give I you an idea you, of what's yeah. going on. Like you could canary call them mine. canary plants, right? Yeah. You. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Good tie-in. But they're uh, planted mainly for mildew. Right. And mildew can destroy a grape crop. So, but roses will get mildew before the grapes do. So they plant, actually, they usually plant varieties of roses that are more susceptible to mildew than ones that are disease resistant. Yeah. Take a break. You're going to carry that over? All right. Those on Facebook. If you insist, I'll do it. Those I'll... on Facebook, no problem. Those on BizTalk Radio, maybe a bit longer. All right. Or maybe that's, uh, that's it for this week for you on, on BizTalk Radio. Hopefully two hours. We are going to take a break. Got to stay on time. News coming up top of the hour for our friends on BizTalk Radio. We're back at six minutes after if you're following us on BizTalk Radio. Pre-recorded show from last week. For those on Facebook Live, we're going to come back even quicker. Stay with us. Your questions, your comments. It is Garden America. Happy Labor Day weekend to you, John, and you, Tiger. Hey, welcome back to the show. If you're tuning in on BizTalk Radio, John, our, our listeners uh, on BizTalk Radio, listening to last week's show, which can confuse some people. Anyway, welcome. We appreciate you. We appreciate those on Facebook Live who tune in. So many faithful listeners and viewers. We do appreciate you. Before we get too much into this uh, next segment here, we want to go back to John. Prior to the break, John, you were answering a question and discussing... Yeah, we were finishing up talking about indicator roses that were planted in vineyards. And uh, those varieties of roses get mildew first before the grapes do. So whenever the farmer um, or the orchardist sees that the roses have mildew, they know it's time to spray the grapes before they get it. Isn't that great? Yeah. That's yeah. a real interesting thing to happen, right? Somebody comes into the nursery, hey, which rose gets the most mildew in the earliest, you know? Like, that'd be just so funny to, not too many people ask for that. You know, it's like imp impatience will let you know that they need water because they droop. Right. And then 20 minutes later, after you water them, they're back up again. I wonder right. if that's where Days of Wine and Roses came from. Hmm. You think, maybe? It makes sense. Know. It makes sense. Got a vineyard yeah. with roses at the end of it? I think so. Yeah. There's a rose, I can't think of the name of it, and for some reason I... The most I'm thinking rose. it begins with V, but it's a, a beautiful high pink hybrid tea, exhibition form, uh, and it mildews really bad. And that's the one one of the ones they use as an indicator rose in France. And uh, it it might come to me, but it's one that I used to have and I don't have anymore. But I would like it again. It begins with a V. I think so. I can't come up with anything right now. I could. It wouldn't be. Right. Well, I know a lot of roses that begin with the V, but I can't think of the particular one that I'm looking for. Oh well. Um, your your so, phone's going off, isn't I it? I know. I, I, it's on silent too. I don't understand what's going ding, on. Ding ding ding. Um, here I'm going to move my camera real quick since it's on me. I brought a, a friend in, a co-host. Yeah, let's here. get a close-up now. He's going to so be co-hosting the the rest of the show with us, right? Yeah. This is uh, Tom. The tomato hornworm here. Tom. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the studio, Tom. And, you know, for those of you watching on Facebook Live, you can see this massive tomato hornworm, which is the size of my finger. Why don't you go ahead and switch it? The camera's on me. You want to do a little camera switch there? Huh? You want me to be on you? No, no, no. no the, the, the camera's on me. Switch that camera to, oh, okay. the, to oh, Tom perfect. here. perfect. No, there I'll you... just switch over here. We yeah, go. there you go. But um, for those of you listening, it's a, a large tomato torn, hornworm that's the size of a, a, a finger. And the problem is, is this was on, I had this plant on the show a couple weeks back. It's a pepino melon, um, kind of a fun fruit. It looked different when you brought it in a couple <laughs> it weeks ago. It had foliage. 
This is one day of damage. I've been watering this plant daily because of the heat. So I've seen it every day this week. And yesterday I came out and I'm like, whoa, what happened to this plant? And then I looked and I found this massive tomato you, horn. You know horn what? On it. You have to look really carefully. Otherwise, you don't even see the, the uh, tomato hornworm. That green blends in so well. That With when tomato Tiger brought, plants, especially. Especially. Yeah. And when Tiger brought it in this morning, he goes, look at this. I'm like, yeah. He goes, no, look closer. I said, whoa, big boy, how you doing? <laughs> um, so after the show, Tom will be no more. Yeah, right, because I just wanted to bring him in the show. But, um, you know, it's funny because it, it brings me, right now there are a lot of tomato hornworms on people's plants. Um, but people always bring um, droppings into the nursery. They bring in a bag with leaves and little black dots. And when you, you said oh. droppings, I thought something else. I'm no, like, that's it's what he's talking about. Yeah, it's, it's poop. These little black dots on the leaves. And they go, oh, this bug is eating my plant. I go, that's not the bug. <laughs> that's the poop, that's from, the the poop worm from the worm right. that is eating your plant. You just can't see the worm. Like you say, they blend in. They blend it's in. actually your plant after it's been digested. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, w worm castings. You right know, there. years ago, I had a, a big, big tomato plant in my patio. And came out one morning, and I saw a tomato hornworm. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I got to get rid of him. And I went, wait, one, two, three. There was yeah. four of them yeah. on there. And that gets intimidating. Right. Because you take four of those, I need to bring in reinforcement myself to get rid of them. Well, the problem, too, is when you go to pull it off of the plant. It doesn't want to come off. They don't want to let go. They don't want to let go. And they're squishy. Yeah. So you're worried you're going to pop it in your fingers. <laughs> or you're going to, yeah. like, pull off part of it. Oh, it's the worst feeling. It's kind of like when a grasshopper lands on you and it just scratches you. Yeah. Lenore says you're disgusting. Lenore <laughs> <laughs> does? What? <laughs> disgusting. Hope not get it yet. Yeah. Um, but, no, they're um, – now, they will turn into what kind of a moth, John? You mentioned this this morning? Hawk moth. Hawk moth. Hawk moth. Right. Yeah. They That's... will fly off with your small animals. Yes, they will. <laughs> yes. Those hawk moths are as big as, my, as big as my hand. They're very large moths. Do you guys remember the tip that we've given in the past for how to easily find those hornworms? Yes. Oh, yeah. There's something about fluorescent. Go out, at, go out at night. With a black light. And they'll, black, they make black flashlights, right? And, they'll, they'll and they shine. glow in the dark. They glow yeah. in the dark, yeah. Yeah, so you can just shine it on your tomatoes. They're glowing, and you just pull them off. Wow. And then, the and then go too, buy chickens and feed them to your chickens. The other thing, too, is that um, I saw one this week on a Ipomea, burgundy-colored Ipomea, which is the potato plant. Um, now, I think they only... Am I wrong? Is that they only uh, attack plants in the Solanaceae, Solanaceae. I mean, so the, the tomato potato family. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Pepino here is in it the Solan, right. Solanaceae family also. But um, the funny thing about it also is that they turn the color of what they're eating. And so this one being on one of those burgundy ipomeas mm -hmm. was a same size as this green one, as but big burgundy? as my finger, but burgundy color oh i don't think i've ever seen I've that i've never seen yeah. it. now that i might like to look at so what because flamingos are like that right they they the reason why flamingos are pink Be is diet. because of what they eat yes right so you know tomato hornworms because you know if they're on a purple plant they turn purple mm. if they're on a green plant they turn green okay so we need to know from our very smart viewers and listeners what that process is <laughs> there's, a, there's a, obviously right? a process there's got to be something it's very common We've wonder, mentioned two species right now. Because humans don't turn the color of what they're eating. Yes, they do if they eat too many carrots. Beta carotene will turn you orange. Turn you orange. Mm -hmm. You can also uh, turn green. With from, envy. From some of the stuff you eat. Oh. <laughs> you can make it get sick to your stomach. and <laughs> Makes you vomit and turn green. So, yeah. so, yeah, there is that process that does affect humans to some degree. Yeah. But what's it called? Yeah. I wonder how hey, many Jan backed me up. She eat. said that chickens love the tomato horn ones. Oh, they go crazy. Oh, yeah, they love it. Yeah. That, that's like a Thanksgiving turkey to chicken. <laughs> oh, when when I've seen them, they go fight after it. They tear it apart. It They're must savage. taste good. All that protein. Yeah. You think they you think they like taste it? Of course. And they're like, oh, this is really yummy. Of course. Otherwise, why would they want it? So, you know, yeah. it's like our cats well, are. You know, you know, they, you can, birds you can, can't smell. Birds can't smell, exactly, right. but they can taste, right? Or not. I would think they could probably taste. Some, I've seen those parrot tongues, and they look but very hard. A lot of taste is smell. Uh, is smell. You're so not one to I speak about taste right now, though. Huh? I know what I cannot <laughs> taste and what I cannot smell. But, but you know how cats are. Okay, so you can feed them the same food one night. The next night, the same thing. I don't want it. But you yeah. had it last night. Yeah, but that was last night. I want something else.
So, yeah, they, there's that taste thing going on. A yeah. dog will eat anything anytime. Yeah. yeah. Some Just, dogs are picky, but for the most part, You got a picky yeah. dog? No, 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 my dog isn't picky. Yeah, but I know I know some people talk about, like you're saying, with the cats. Like, yeah. Some people's dogs they are They don't very want picky. it now. It's particular. You know what some dogs eat. How picky can you be? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's yeah. true. Uh, that's yeah. true. Jan says that praying manis can change color. Oh, yeah, I think I've heard that, too. Like but depend, that wouldn't but the, be from what they eat, though. No, that's more like a chameleon kind of a thing. Oh, to blend into to blend the, into the yeah. environment? Yeah. Oh. You yeah. know what? You should Google an image of a praying mantis that's not green. Yeah. No, they have them for put, sure. Put it up there. Put it up there? Yeah, All show right. our people. Yeah. Hmm. The beauty. The, one more reason to watch this on Facebook Live that you can't do on BizTalk Radio to see some of these visuals. A- example, well, last week we had a lot of visuals in the studio, so Tiger's going to put something like that up there. Yeah, I know we talked about it, but did we mention um, what's going on in San Diego with the Plumeria show today and tomorrow? Yeah, Room 101 in Balboa Park. John, I think you're right. going to be a guest speaker with your wife, Shannon. <laughs> no, I won't be a speaker, but I, I, I think that we may go to the show tomorrow. There's supposed to be Hawaiian music there, which you love, right? Absolutely. I'm a Don Ho fan from way back. There you go. And, um, and a plant sale. Plus, uh, you can look at flowers, a flower show. How can you not want to go? Yeah. Flower show, Hawaiian music, plant sale, plumerias coming I out of everywhere. I was thinking that I don't need any more plumeria. But since my wife asked me yesterday about going, now I'm thinking. Is that, is that also like maybe moose? I do. Singular, plumeria, more than one is still plumeria? Look at all the plumeria I have or look at all, all the plumerias I have. We're going to think about that because we have to go to a break, John. That's a John. good question. Okay, it is break time once again here on uh, Facebook Live, Biz Talk Radio. Thank you to our friends on Biz Talk Radio, Stephanie, her team, keeping us on the air every week. I'm Brian Main. Happy Labor Day weekend. Tiger Palafox, John Bagnasco, stay with us back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. Thank you for being there. We are back on this long Labor Day weekend. Hopefully it's a long one for you. As we continue, thank you for joining us each and every weekend. I do want to mention, go to our website. We really urge you to go to our website as many times as you can. Check it out. Take a look. We've got links to uh, the various shows that we archive, our podcast, our uh, other shows as well, digital streaming, GardenAmerica.com. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter. John puts a lot of work into it. It's a great newsletter. Gives you insights. There's articles. People send in pictures. GardenAmerica.com. Once you do that, come back and report to us. Well, John, here we are. Labor Day weekend 2022. A hot one, too. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be even hotter today. Hottest weather of the season so far for us in San Diego. I hope this is the peak. Yeah. You know, I, I put in uh, some tips on, uh, and we've been talking about some tips to get plants through the hot wet- weather. One is to water thoroughly in the morning right. so that they can make it through the heat. But one of the things you might not think of is that, and it's too late to start now, but keep your plants healthy all during the season. You know, if you if you put mulch over an area to keep the soil cool and hold more moisture— the roots are going to spread out further. And the more that they spread out, the healthier the plant's going to be so that when it does come under stress, like the heat we have now, it's going to make it through. Okay. If you have a little tiny uh, root system because you haven't been watering or you haven't kept the plant healthy, it's going to be more susceptible when the uh, hot weather strikes. It's like putting a jacket on before you go outside. Prepare exactly. for the weather. Yeah. And then uh, the Not other this time of the year, obviously, but in the winter time. Another thing I was thinking of you about is that some plants, you know, are from temperate climates. They just hate the heat, especially some of the house plants that we have that are a little more tender. Um, bring those in if it's really hot. If you've got a hot Santa Ana wind, temperatures over a hundred degrees, just bring them in the house. We tend to get those in October here in yeah, Southern California do. as well. Or or uh, if you do have any kind of plant in a container, it can be moved. So maybe you can move it 
under the shade of a tree, uh, the other side of the house. Just move it somewhere where the hot sun's not going to be on it. Okay, great tips. Todd, you we Today, have something posted up there in a few minutes? I do. Okay. Yeah. So um, refresh if you have to, those on Facebook Live. And I'll be on KUSI this morning talking about um, planting trees and yard uh, things that you can do in your yard to be, uh, you know, say, talking about saving water, talking about mulch, proper ways to water. You've become a um, regular on KUSI, huh? Kind of fell yeah. into that, right? Yeah. Because they, they asked me one week, and I like, you know what? You want you Tiger? You want me? Have yeah. you on with Tiger? I can't do it. Let's get Tiger. And now it's the, and now it's the Tiger show. <laughs> but um, But you know one thing people don't think about because – we talk about planting trees properly to shade a house and people right. instantly, when you say that people think the tree is blocking the sun and then shading the house, which is one way to think about it. But another way to think about something actually shading a house too, to keep and, it cool. Well, but if you just plant, even if it's not a large tree, even just some large shrubs uh, on the wall of a home that gets really intense heat, those shrubs absorb a lot of the heat from the sun before they get to the wall of that house as almost like insulation. It's like a filter. Yeah, it's like a filter, like insulation. And so that way that wall doesn't get so hot, which now you don't have to run your AC so much. Who wants which... a hot wall? Nobody, right? <laughs> I don't want a hot wall. If you live in England sometimes, yeah, it's Yeah, cold. that's true. But, um, you know, so there's other, other ways to think about uh, using shrubs or trees or plants to cool your home than just, oh, a large tree. Because then people think, oh, I don't want a large tree because mess, it drops right. in the house, all this stuff. But there are other plants out there that you know can just act as like what you said, like a filter, like mm -hmm. insulation. So that way you don't have direct sun on those walls of your home. It's like if you planted a circle of redwood trees <laughs> and then walked into the circle of redwood trees, it would be 10 degrees cooler inside than outside. Yeah. That's a good idea. We should we should do that, John. We should we should plant a circle of redwood I, trees. I need some redwood trees at my house. Yeah. They would do well with I enough don't water. Know. I don't think so. <laughs> a lot of water. I just yeah. had an avocado day. Yeah, what? I planted two oh, avocados. Oh. Room. I didn't look at the tag, so it was either surprise oh, or bummer. or a reed. One now of the now two. I know why John doesn't lean on me too hard when I occasionally have something that doesn't uh, grow well or die. I let because he I, just kind of let that slip out here about his avocado. Yeah, but John's growing environment is a lot more difficult than yours. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, talk about hot. You know, interesting, you moved from Michigan. You think that if you're going to move to California, you're going to find a place on the beach yeah. next oh, to the yeah. coast. Right? No. Come he, on now. He starts off in where? Del Zura? Where'd you start off? Del Zura. Del Sur. Or what was it called? Deleuze. Deleuze. Well, no, he started out in San Marcos. Okay. Yeah. Moved from San Marcos to Bonsal. Okay, Ooh. you're way inland now. That's still not Bonsal fine. to Rainbow. Ugh. Okay. Rainbow to Deleuze. Way yeah, far. To, Deleuze to Fallbrook. Yeah. yeah. But I've been in Fallbrook now for 32 years. Okay, well. You know. Yeah. That's but Fallbrook wanna, That's what is, you want to do, I guess. Fallbrook is almost an idea. They say Vista is the ideal climate. But Fallbrook's pretty close because it's not in the valley. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't heat up like Temecula or Escondido. And you almost, at least in my house, we always have the ocean breeze. But still, so, you're looking at 100 degrees today. When you have a 100-degree breeze, it's hot. You can't get around <laughs> That's it. That's just hot air blowing around, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a furnace. Our friend Car Carla mentions that if um, I, well, I don't buy a plumeria, to tell Shannon that Heirloom Roses has their hydrangeas on sale for $25. <laughs> I've never Ooh, forgotten that that's hydrangeas. her favorite plant. Yeah. yeah, she absolutely loves those plants. Well, they're but beautiful. I'll tell you, this time of year with 100 degree temperatures, uh, it's hard to keep hydrangeas going. Oh, good. I yeah. can finally admit something. <laughs> Why? You killed yours? Not all the way, but it looks like toast. <laughs> It, the leaves. All the leaves have crunched up, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And I didn't want to say anything because yeah. I'm doing everything right. I'm watering. But, but you know what? Tough. The stems are still green. Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't look good at all. That's another tip. When it's hot like this, don't keep pouring water on plants. They yeah. can't do anything with right, it. Right, right. No, I'm not overdoing you know, if, it. I'm just... Yeah, if you water in the morning, that's fine. But it hasn't looked... But you know what, though? It will, in the past, when it's done that, it's bounced back pretty well. Tom didn't get off the... Uh, Branch did he crawling around the no, studio? No, but I just found an offspring. Check this out. Let me see if I can do this here. Um, sorry. How come I, I, don't, how come I don't see your? Do you see his uh, no. pictures posted on Facebook? There he goes. 
can't. No, no, the pictures he posted of in. the um. Oh no. The different color. No. Um. Praying mantis. It's on the page. It's not on the chat. Oh, it's on the page. Okay. Yeah. But there's a little baby Tom right there nibbling away on this stem. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I just see the big one down below. Yeah, it's, I I don't want to. It kind of turns blurry as I. Uh, that's it right there right above the uh, the the big one right Lenore who's out in canyon country where it's nice and warm says that she has uh, young plumerias that have never flowered but this year they're just starting to you had that problem did you fertilize them Lenore because (laughs) John was growing plumeria for the foliage also for a while there yeah but I think we know mine was because they were in containers. They'd been there for years. Uh-huh. Uh, they went one year without even a leaf. <laughs> we're going to take a break. We've They're got all doing to, good now, though. Two more segments coming up, a uh, longer segment coming up next, our last segment, the shorter one. So those on Facebook Live, of course, questions, comments. How about those tomato hornworms that uh, Tiger brought in for show and tell today? And he also put a picture of a tomato hornworm, a different color one, burgundy. And the other one was a praying mantis on our Facebook page. Check that out. Biz Talk Radio taking a break. Back after these messages. We are back at it. Those on Best Talk Radio, remember, Facebook Live. Go to our Facebook page, Garden America Radio Show, to watch us live, interact. You can ask questions, comment, as well as uh, what many of the people are doing this morning during this show. We had Nick on earlier talking about uh, pistachios, nuts, almonds, the entire gambit here on Garden America. I think I'm going to leave Tom on your palm tree back here, and let's see if it let's actually eats Let's not Plastic. do that. <laughs> let's not do. Let's take. Let's you take come t- in. You come in on Tuesday because you're not coming in on Monday. No, no. Right? That's plenty of time for him to do something we don't want him to do. Yeah. So Tom and Tom Jr. can go with Tiger after the show. <laughs> hey, um, Hastam wants to know uh, the best way to propagate tomatoes from seeds or cuttings. I never even thought of doing tomatoes from cuttings, even no. though you easily could. You could, right? Yeah, because mm-hmm. they root easily from the stem, but. Uh, at least here in the United States, there's such a uh, easy easy plant to get from seed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. seeds are abundant, so I would I would plant them from seed, but I would not save the seed from a tomato, Hastam, because if you save the seeds and it's a hybrid tomato and you go ahead and plant it, you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. If it's an heirloom tomato, those are pretty well stabilized, so. Uh, you can go ahead and save the seeds on those, but not on hybrids. If you did have a hybrid tomato and you took a cutting, you would continue that variety of tomato. So you could do that. Yeah. Or you can introduce something new. Who knows, Hassan? You could have a really unique, rare, cross-pollinated tomato <laughs> that, you know, whatever. Have some fun. Why not? Exactly. He also asks if uh, there's evergreen-type tomatoes here in the United States. Yeah, they're Cause different they're, solanums, right? They just have the. I don't uh, think they're edible. Some summer ones, <laughs> right. but there are tomato. Um, cool season. Cool season tomatoes. Here we have tomatoes. A lot of them come from Russia, that will fruit during the cool temperatures, and then there's also a, a species tomato we've talked about before called the lychee tomato, uh, L I T C H I. Or L Y C H E E tomato, yep. which is a shrub, yep. and it does produce a edible uh, tomato-like fruit, which is really sweet and little, really pretty flowers too. Little tougher though, right? The and, skin, right? Well, I mean, just the fruit is more firm. You know, I, I'm thinking tomato. I think very soft, like I can squish it in my hand. The lychee one, it's it's more is it like, soft too? Yeah, but it's like a. Um, more like a cherry tomato. Okay. Is this Stupich? Is that is that a Stupich? Is that a cool season tomato? Stupich is a cool season Anything tomato. That's Russian from name. the Czech Republic. Right. Because we had a back and forth about the correct pronunciation for right. a while. Right. That was one of my favorite calls when the listener said, because we it's spelled S T U P I C E, right? Yeah. So we just pronounced it stupid. Yeah. Stupis. And we've said this before, Stupichka, but he, right. He, yeah, Stupichka. He's, it's Stupich or Stupichka. Right. And he called and said, the only thing stupid about that tomato is the way you pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we, we like well comments done. like that. Well, well, yeah, we well never, played. It's we true. We never forgot, right? No, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. There's one also, I think, a cool season tomato that grows in Mexico, Tango Frio. Isn't <laughs> tiger? Is the... <laughs> oh, good one, Brian. Good one, Tango Frio. <laughs> uh, Jan mentions that there's, uh, she says some rootstocks put out roots that survive better in hot weather. And some... She's talking about roses, I uh -huh, think. Uh -huh. And there is a root stock that's really popular in uh, California now called Fortuniana. Mm -hmm. And it's a root stock that was used almost exclusively in the South because if you plant a rose in the ground in anywhere in the South, it'll be dead within two years. They won't grow because of the nematodes. But Fortuniana is so vigorous that it outgrows any nematode damage. So they, they used it for a long time there. In California, we don't have that problem with the nematodes, so no one ever thought of using Fortuniana root, rootstock here. But probably 20 years ago, people began to use some because they were buying rose varieties from nurseries in the south, and they came that way. And, and they, they were grow. shocked at the vigor of those roses. You'd get about 30% more flowers from a rose that's on Fortuny and a rootstock. And it also tolerates um, uh, drought better and will also take extra water. So the best of both worlds. Wow. There you go. Yeah. The only Good old bad Fortuny thing. Anna. Yeah, the only bad thing about the, for, or I should say the only negative about Fortuny Anna is that. You can't bear root it, so the plants have to be sold in containers. If you bear root them, you damage the plant or kill it. Well, that's the tough thing with bear root in general. You know, when they're talking about fruit trees, roses, when is that time of year? Is Southern California at least is that it's very difficult for the bear root plants to stay in a bear root form because it's just so warm, right? And almost weeks after you get them in bare root they're already putting out those small roots you know those little white roots that when you pull those out of the bare root medium you know like you're saying it kind of damages it and you don't want to do that so you know areas where it's cold and bare root stays bare root it's great to do but i i think in most warm climates people are just moving into the whole put them in, in cans mm -hmm. take them that way Hey, Carla says that she really loved uh, the photo in the newsletter from uh, Burling, mm. uh, who put in a picture the of rose. the Marion Ross Rose. Yeah. And to use this opportunity to mention that if you're in the San Diego area, in the end of October— October 30th. There's going to be a rose show and a auction in— Oceanside. Oceanside, California. Right. And Marion Ross, hopefully, if she's in good health, will be there celebrating her 94th birthday. And Burling has given us a rose to auction off that was named after Marion Ross. Well, I can think of two people she's younger than, Tony Bennett and Dick Van Dyke. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she's not the oldest person in the world, but we're oh. still going to celebrate but her birthday. We're still going to celebrate, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, Shout out and a thanks to Mission Hills Nursery, who is supporting the event. Yes. Yeah. And if you go to, I just started putting the roses up online, but if you go to ccrsauction.com, you can find out all the details. And CCRS stands for California Coastal Rose Society. Um, and it also says uh, thank you to Mission Hills Nursery on there, and there's a link. Mm -hmm. If you click on it, you can go to Mission Hills and learn all about Mission Hills Nursery. And we should mention, too, that you can, you can uh, uh, not, I was going to say bet online. You can, <laughs> you can bid online. You don't have to be in San Diego for Isn't the roses. Isn't that one of the propositions yeah, coming up yeah, in the election yeah, is right. online but betting? And this the, guy the just rose, so confused. The yeah. Rose Society is really getting behind betting online. Yeah. No, bid, bidding online. Bid, B-I-D, not B-I-T. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it, it's going to be fun. And Brian, you'll be there to auction off well, the along roses with Tiger. and Tiger's Tiger my will help. System. Yeah. And we're going to be splitting the auction duties. Yeah. There is, um, if you're coming from out of town, there is a uh, right across the street from. Is a bar? <laughs> there is a bar <laughs> in the Marriott Hotel right across the street. 
for those that you know need to pick me up. Yeah, yeah. But if you want to spend the night, you know, come in um, uh, Saturday morning and then spend the night because we'll have uh, we've got three great speakers on Saturday. Uh, Greg Lowry from Vintage Gardens in Sebastopol is going to be talking about rose preservation, along with Anita Clevenger from the Sacramento Historic Rose Society and Burling Leong, who hybridized the Marion Ross Rose. The Marion Ross Rose, by the way, is really cool. It's one I think you'd like, Brian. Really? Because it's pink, but the center's uh, tans and browns. See, I love, I love the two-tone. Yeah. yeah. Two, three-tone roses. Yeah, I agree. Still can't find a George Byrne rose these days. You know, I almost bought you one the other day, and I thought, you know, where'd you see? You he thought, can why, buy his why bother? Own rose. Exactly. <laughs> it's like I tell someone, "Hey, I, I thought of you the other day." Really? I go, yeah, but it went out of my mind quick. <laughs> where did you? Where did you see it, John? The George Byrne online. Online, obviously. <sighs> what did I see? Rabbit holes of online plant oh, shopping. I think I was having roses butted up in. And I was thinking someone had the George Burns rose, and I was going to say, could you uh, send Budwood to Wisconsin and have one butted up for Brian? But the the real reason I didn't do that, the, the <laughs> Ooh, first of all, it was— out the real— Well, part of the reason was it was too much trouble. Yeah. But, I, I know. I believe that. But the main reason was that um, I had already sent in 200 roses to be budded. No, I, I got you. So and, well, pushing and, your luck. Don't push your luck, little man. And uh, he <laughs> he told me, you know, that that's enough. <laughs> no got, more roses for you. <laughs> no more roses. That's good. we got to take a break on this Labor Day weekend. One more segment coming up with your friends here on Garden America. Stay with us. Okay, we made it. The final segment. That's it, gang. This is it. Those on BizTalk Radio, those on Facebook Live, we have done enough damage. So in the next seven minutes, which is the entirety of this segment, uh, that's going to do it for this Labor Day weekend until next year, John, when hopefully we're back together for Labor Day 2023. Wow. We've got a, yeah. we've, we've got a few radio, new radio listeners, huh? Over, yeah, the, we, over the past couple weeks. We do. We've been getting some notices about going on different Different regions, different right. radio stations across the country. Yeah, so we, you know, so, it may not be, we don't grow like uh, seaweed or bamboo. Yeah, we're slow growing. Yeah, but we do grow. Yeah, but um, you know, it'd be fun. I mean, if you're if you are listening, um, on the radio, like a turtle cactus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> turtle cactus. Yes, we're more of a turtle cactus. If, if you are listening on the radio, we'd still love to hear from you throughout the week. If you go to our Facebook, you know there is a. a a message feature. You can send us a message. Yeah. Ask a question. We can answer it during the following show as well. Because we we really are interested in knowing or finding out and helping people uh, solve their gardening problems. Sure. So, now, of course, you can tune in tune in every week like you are. Right. But as, as you mentioned, Tiger, make it a you know twenty four seven seven days a week. You get something on your mind. You think of something. Go to our Facebook page. We'll answer it. If not then, then during the show. And great way to send a picture, too. Yeah, send us pictures. pictures help us a lot when it comes to solving problems. You know, a lot of people will describe a problem, but if they can send a picture, mm -hmm. as we talked about with the tomato hornworms, people think that the droppings are the bugs eating the plant. Well, no, those are just the bugs. And you're a dropping expert, too. This is why people should send those pics to you. I wonder if, I, wonder if, uh, I guess, tomato hornworms would be a, a casting. A casting. It would be a hornworm worm casting. A hornworm casting. Because you know, there's there's poop, there's castings, there's manure, there's, there's guano. Um, guano. Um, and where was I going with this? Um oh shoot. Oh, scat. There's you know, scat, there's yes. there is scat yeah. experts, uh -huh. right? Where you can go out in the forest and, and identify they'll tell you what bear, scat. They'll see like bear, they'll look at like bear they can see what they've eaten. Yep. Oh, the bear had this, the bear had that. There's berries in there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So Brian, you were gonna major in scatology and <laughs> scatology. I did. I did. I did you? no minor. I minored. You minored? I right. minored in it. Yeah. But uh, I like <laughs> scatology. Scatology? Is that what yeah. You yeah. <laughs> I thought that's what you told a cat. Scat. Skedaddle. Yeah. Scat. <laughs> Who says that anymore? To a scat. 
Why would you say, why would it be scat to get rid of a cat, but not stog to get rid of a dog? <laughs> See? You think like I do. Yeah, yeah. stog. Stog. Oh, wow. Scat, stog. You, you can tell it's the last segment. Yeah. Hey, our, uh, our buddy Rick from Star, Idaho, says that he's stuck in uh, fire country in Oregon. Oh, good luck. He's going to try to drive to Sacramento today, so uh, be safe, Rick. Wow, yeah. Yeah, we have, time we, of have the year. One, we have one burning right here in San Diego County, We had a few County, smaller right? ones that, that they got a hold Currently. of or, or got a, yeah. got a uh, What's burning handle now? on. Um, out in East, East um, County. County. Always there was, East County. Yeah, Boys, there was yeah. one. In, but it, it seems like they have it under control, which is obviously a you know, very nice blessing. But um, you know, now is the time of year when we do have to be really careful. The winds pick up the dry right. weather out there by John where he lives for sure. I don't have any. <laughs> we, always, we always bag up. It's always John back to lives. John. Yeah, it's hot where you live. There's it's fires. Hot fires. Can't grow anything. Can't Got gr- three and a half hours to water. I don't really have any trees near my house, I don't think. I don't think it'd be much of a fire hazard. And when we built, we had to put in a special fire sprinkling system. And we have cement roof tiles. Do you, do you have any ground cover around the place that would help retard the fire? Uh, our ground cover is decomposed granite. Well, so, which, so the answer is which yes. doesn't burn. So the answer However, is yes. I've got enough mulch now <laughs> that that yeah. might start a fire. Deborah Lee Baldwin used to call her property something, and it was like, you know, she used to talk about how hard her soil was. I forget what she used to call it. She, she, she used to call it like the, uh, you know, you know, decomposed brick or something hardest, like that. you know, land on earth or something like that. But she always described her property as being very difficult to grow on. And, um, you know, it's it's tough out there in those kind of more um, you know rural areas yeah. when you're dealing with rocks mm-hmm. and hard soil and you know just tough place to grow things. It really limits you. Yeah, Lenore mentions uh, she's out in Canyon Country and she mentions that they have the Castaic Fire. Out oh, up there. there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Boy, Castaic is hot. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been through Castaic? Where is that? It's uh, if you're going north on, fifteen. Um, uh, it's north wow. of uh, Magic Mountain. Uh, what's that? Oh town? my gosh, I know oh, exactly. Valencia? Where... Yeah, Valencia. North, of north of Valencia. If you go out, as you're going out of Valencia, uh, you come to Castaic. Oh, that's hot. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know what you're talking about because yeah, you you pass Magic Mountain and then. You're just getting ready to go through a furnace of a right. of a drive right. until you, until you hit like Ventura. Can you imagine being at Magic Mountain, which is probably just as hot, right? Yeah, this time yeah, of year, yeah. you're on the roller coaster and it gets stuck. No oh, goodness. And they're saying, you know what? It's going to be a while. No, that's we can dangerous. get you down. It's can dangerous. you imagine that? I lost a lost a Lexus engine in Castaic. Oh no! One year. Say that again. You lost what? A Lexus engine. He was driving a Lexus. Oh, I lose those the all the engine. time, don't you, Tiger? And the engine went out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Where, where's the engine? <laughs> my, we were taking a trip up north, and my wife had gone to Walmart and had the oil changed. Oh, yeah? And most people, I Put imagine, oil in. Take, their, <laughs> take their Lexus to so. Walmart to have the oil changed, and... I, it just the engine just burned up because there was no oil in it. I was gonna say most people when they get an oil change, they put yeah. the oil in. They drained the oil. They forgot they to forgot change it. it. Oh my yeah. gosh! I know. Oh, that's bad. That's a great story. It, it is was. now. It is not then. What was nice is that uh, uh, someone ended up giving me a Lexus engine to put in it. So it cost me four hundred dollars to get what? the new engine Why put would in. A, the oil change place just give you a new you engine. Know, yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. You, you go back to that. Well, you know what? There's more to this. Well, we don't need to get into yeah. it. I can tell this gets sticky. Hey, that's going to do it, guys. All right. Quick show. We appreciate Nick being on. We appreciate yeah. our Facebook viewers, BizTalk Radio listeners. The rest of the weekend, are you working or what are you doing? I work on Monday. Okay. But I have today. Good. After, after the KUSI, I'm done. Send me a couple of videos, work. if you would, Will when do. you think about it. You're going to be watering. I'm yes. going to be watering. I'm going to be yeah. transplanting a hibiscus he gave You should take today. Dana to the Plumeria show. Yeah. A little Hawaiian music. Is you that, got your Hawaiian shirts. Is that today? Today and, and tomorrow. tomorrow. Ooh, ooh, both days. Could. What, what both, about tomorrow? Both days not. Ooh, tomorrow's worse. He's got a busy, yeah, Home <laughs> got Depot. got things happening. Got a, 
Hey, thank you so much time. for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your Labor Day weekend. Thank you for spending at least part of it with us here on Garden America. We appreciate you. Uh, we love having you each and every weekend. Don't forget during the week, uh, send your pictures, your questions right there on our Facebook page. For the entire crew, our uh, buddies and teammates at uh, BizTalk Radio, Stephanie and the rest of them, uh, Tiger Palafox, Mission Hills Nursery, John Bagnesco, I'm Brian Maine. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you back here, right here. Same time, same stations, same streaming, same digital on Garden America. Take care.